Welcome everyone once again to ChessLecture.com. This is International Master William Pascal. Today's topic is a little different than any other video I've done. It's um, entitled, Avoiding Queen Exchanges When the Enemy's King is Exposed. Now, you might expect me to show you a couple of games where I exploit this concept to a T. Well, instead of doing that, I'm going to show you a couple of situations where actually I fail to practice what I preach. So we're going to get to some interesting positions. Where I'm going to illustrate for you how important it is not to exchange queens because the enemy king is out in the open and the queen is the strongest piece, the most powerful piece, the most mobile piece. Keep the queen on the board, if possible, when the opponent's king is exposed. In this way you can best exploit your advantage of the opponent having an exposed king. The first game that I'm going to show is one of my own games and this is from the Norwegian Open Championship in Norway 2006. My opponent was only rated 2000. This was the first round of an open tournament and I'm playing a 2000 rated player. So I'm much the favorite and in fact I achieved a terrific position out of the opening that actually is part of one of my lectures here on chesslecture.com. So let's go through this game. My opponent played c4 and I played e5. Now I illustrated a system against the English here in a lecture series, so I think you should take a look at that if you haven't already. This system is basically something like a reverse grand prix attack against the Sicilian. It worked perfectly against this weaker opponent. My opponent played knight to c3, I played knight to c6. Here we have g3, f5, bishop to g2, knight to f6, and now the move that I like to see the most, e3, creating a hole at the d3 square. It's even tempting for black to go as far as to play e4 here, but I think that move is a little bit premature. Instead, black has this fantastic gambit idea, d5. Again, for further details, go to my series on a system against the English opening. So my opponent, as most people in this position are, was taken quite aback by this gambit. After c takes d5, knight to b4, again trying to exploit the hole at d3, he reacted rather badly. The best chance is to play d3 in this position. But he played d4, which allows me to seal off his protection of that d5 pawn with the move e4, as well as give my knight a possible invasion point at d3. Black already has a very promising position. So, after e4, my opponent reacted here with a rather natural move. And it's not such a bad idea, although it is rather passive. Bishop to f1. Very rational thing to do. Prevent the knight to d3 check. However, my opponent is rather backwards in development. The one thing about this position, though, you have to consider is that he, although he is behind in development, it is a very closed structure. And throughout the game, I was actually quite frustrated by this fact, as you will see. So we have bishop f1, knight on b takes d5, I have a good outpost for my pieces on the d5 square, now knight on g to e2, White obviously is fighting for space. He's very cramped and behind in development. Bishop to e6. Knight takes d5. And here I wasn't even sure which way to recapture, to be honest. Decided on the bishop recapture. Bishop takes d5. Basically, I didn't want to trade a lot of pieces against the lower rated player. So this is why I didn't play knight takes d5 inviting him to trade pieces with, say, knight to f4, knight to c3. 
wanted to keep the pieces on the board, thus bishop takes d5. In the event of knight c3 or knight to f4, I'll retreat my bishop back to f7. So, in any case, we're not going to go into great detail on the opening here. Bishop takes d5, knight to c3. Now, you see the opponent's king is still in the center, of course. I want to preserve my bishop, bishop to e6. Still have very good control of d5. Now, bishop to d2, and completing my development with bishop to d6. Now, he is very cramped, and there is... You know, you have to consider the fact that I could go for a, a kingside pawn storm with something like g5 and f4 in this structure if white is to castle routinely on the king's side. And I think he was understandably a little bit worried about that, and thus he actually does not castle and leaves his king in the center, a rather risky thing to do, but maybe not out of the realm of possibility because the position is so very closed. Staying with the king in the center, as it is in the Sicilian, sometimes in the English, is viable. After bishop to d6, he played rook to c1. Pressuring the c-file, I wanted to just cement my control over d5. So I played c6, also nullifying any pressure along the c-file. Knight to a4. So he's basically seeking counterplay while leaving his king in the center. I think a very reasonable thing to do. Queen to e7 at this point, which defends my b7 pawn laterally in the event of knight to c5. Knight to c5, and now bishop to d5, where my piece is very strong in the center. In fact, I may be threatening breaks with f4 already in this position. So black has a very strong game. Here he decided to play bishop to c4. This move is a bit double-edged. Arguably, my bishop on d5 is a very strong piece, but it nevertheless is a bad bishop, and nevertheless, his bishop is a good bishop. He is going to have a complex of weak squares on the white colored complex. Look at the g2, h3, f3, e2 square complex. Weaknesses all over the place. So later on, this haunts him during the game. But I, I kind of understand. And that's also the beginner's mentality of wanting to trade pieces against the higher rated player. What some people refer to as the trade, trade, lose policy. So bishop to c4. Trading pieces. I castle king side. Again, this game is against a 2,000 player, much lower rated opponent. It was from the Norwegian Open 2006 first round. I'm expecting a nice easy game. I castle, my king's ready to go to h8. I think it's safe to say I have a clear advantage here based solely on space. So, I was very happy at this point with my position. Everything went according to plan. Here he played queen to b3, pressuring b7, increasing the pressure on d5. Very logical move. After queen to b3, I played rook f7, breaking the pin against my king as well as defending b7 a second time. Perfect move, also allowing for me to double rooks perhaps later with rook on a to f8. Now at this point, I think I probably expected my opponent to castle. Certainly there are some dangers that have to be attributed to this move. Some kind of attack based on knight to g4, and my queen coming to maybe g5, but it's not so easy to actually execute that. Honestly speaking, um, maybe castles are the lesser of the evils here for white, because it's not so easy for black to just storm through on the king side in this particular position. But my opponent made a move that, you know, it, it sort of comes as a total shock. When the opponent plays a move like this, it's very easy to become overconfident. At this point, he played king to e2. Now, this move is very optimistic and, I think, a serious mistake. Voluntarily putting his king in the center, forfeiting the right to castle, in a position where I have a very dominating space advantage. So I think this is a very serious mistake. White's advantage at this point um, is really starting to skyrocket.
If you put this on a computer program, it would probably rate the position as over two pawns advantage for black, despite having no material advantage whatsoever. My positional advantage is so great at this point, I could do almost anything here. I made a debatable decision at this point to trade off the knight on c5, but I was basically looking to just play a position with good knight against bad bishop, with his king stuck in the center of the board. And I think this was a perfectly reasonable approach. So bishop takes c5. Now he played bishop takes d5, a move which I don't think really benefits him in any way, but he wanted to recapture on c5 with a rook. I played knight takes d5, and now rook takes c5. He can try to ultimately create some kind of minority attack on the queen side with b4, b5. But the bottom line is I have a monster knight at d5. His king is in the center of the board. The queens are on the board. Now let me make something very clear. If you take the queens off the board in this position, I don't think that black's advantage, if he has one at all, is of any significance. A strong knight, admittedly, but Boyd has a better pawn structure, minority attack potential, and his bishop on d2 is not all that bad. But this position with the queens on the board is a, it's just a travesty for white. His king will never find safe haven here. And I have a very obvious attempt to break down the position with g5 and f4 in mind. Probably I'll play king h8 at some point, prepare it, and then g5 and f4, opening the game to my advantage. So after rook takes c5, I played a different move, rather than king h8. Interesting move, queen to g5. I just wanted to get my queen into those weak white squares and start causing trouble. Perfectly reasonable move. Now at this point, hard to say what he should do. There is one possibility, king d1, to try to run with the king to the queen side. He was probably afraid of something like, in that case, queen g4 check, king c1, queen e2. But even so, maybe white is okay after just bishop 2, e1, I'm not sure. Then you're bringing the rook back to c2, possibly. So this idea of castling manually on the queen side may not have been a bad idea. That's a little bit deep for our 2,000 player to come up with. After queen g5, he played queen to c2, making way for the minority attack with b4. Now here I have to admit I was having trouble finding a concrete plan. Queen h5 check, king to e1, and now rook to f6. And basically my idea is to lift the rook to h6, bring my queen to f3, and pick off the h2 pawn, if nothing else. In one move order or another, I want to try to win the h2 pawn. At some point, he's probably going to play h4 to try to stop the loss of his h pawn. So we get to this position. After rook f6, b4, he starts his minority attack. Very logical plan. a6, trying to hold it up. Now I expected a4, but he took a time out to play h4. Now this move is double-edged because I could play g5 and now his pawn is actually pinned to his unprotected rook on h1. But nevertheless, he was going to have some problems there. So after h4, I played rook to h6, preparing possibly g5 and some combination of g5, queen to f3, harassing that rook on h1 and pinning the rook on h1, rather pinning the pawn to the rook on h1. Notice his king is not in a safe position at all, in the long run. So, everything was basically going my way, but I started to become a little bit frustrated because I couldn't find a way to break the position open very quickly. I want to beat this 2,000 player. Queen to d1 now, trying to trade queens. I, I knew it very clearly in my mind. Do not trade queens when you have the enemy king open in the center. So, what do you do? Queen f7. Keeping the queen active, 
preparing g5 and not trading queens. And there's no real sense to his move queen d1 ultimately. Now he continued with a minority attack a4. I broke with g5. Everything's going according to plan. Now, king to e2, another move that shocked me a little bit. At this point, black's position is extremely promising. I think the easiest way to win is probably just a straight forward f4. It looks really logical and extremely strong. I mean, this is a break that I've been aiming for for some time. And of course, the point is if h takes g, f3 check, the king is forced back and he loses his rook at h1. It's hard to explain. It was the first round of the tournament. I'm often in very bad form in such situations. In any case, I played not the best move. I played g takes h. Not so bad, though. Not such a bad move. g takes h4. g takes h4. Fundamentally, the position hasn't changed. Now here at this point, I think the most sensible thing to do is king to h8, preparing to use the g file for my a rook. And I still have f4, maybe even f4 coming very quickly. First I want to get my king off the open file in case he starts to attack me on the g file. Very simple. So what did I do? Here I broke a cardinal rule. I lost total sense of my objectivity. What did I play? Queen h5 check without a plan. Queen h5 check, king to e1. Now there was no sense in doing this. And what happens is I trade queens because I'm tired or frustrated or both and I give away all of my advantage. All of my advantage. In fact, in this position, black no longer has an advantage after trading queens. Whereas without trading queens, black's advantage in this position is massive. After g takes h, king h8, I would say about two pawns advantage to black and almost a sure win because of the threat of f4, the weakness of the h4 pawn, the exposed position of the enemy king. Do not do what I did. I traded queens and allowed him to escape into an endgame where he has no problems at all. After queen takes, king takes d1. This position may be a little bit better for black. But I mean, I've traded down from a massive advantage to a very slight advantage. Now I'm slightly better because I have a better knight and he has a somewhat bad bishop. I was unable to win this game and it's actually no surprise at all. He has a minority attack with b5. It's not easy for me to gang up on his weak h pawn. His king is in the center, which is useful for the end game, by the way. So don't do what I did. I'd like to share one more example of how not to trade queens in this kind of situation. Another game I played, going back to the initial position, this was against a very strong player in contrast to the last game. My opponent is Grandmaster Mark Blofstein from Canada, and this was actually played recently. Um, to my recording of this lecture. This game was actually played in um, my last tournament, which was June of 2007 in Budapest. Mark Loschstein is white, I'm black, and um, I was prepared for the Nimzo Indian. He played d4. We're not going to spend a lot of time here on the opening. But um, we will say that this variation that he played, which he often plays, um, against the Nimzo Indian f3, is a variation that is very interesting, does have certain drawbacks. It's a little bit slow in terms of the king side development. It doesn't contribute to his pieces coming out. It's simply a, a very obvious attempt to control the e4 square. The main variation here is actually d5. Um, but I decided to try something a little bit different and it worked out very well. I played a different variation than I had in the past. Castled, allowing white to achieve e4. 
and then breaking in a center as if it was a French defense with d5. And the characteristic of this position is really very much in the spirit of the French defense. So d5, e5, knight on f to d7, and now f4, position again very much like the French defense. He wastes the tempo, but he supports his center. Now I attack the center as in the French defense with c5. He plays knight to f3. He's opened up wide. I mean, he's really pushed all four pawns, like a four pawns attack. His king is kind of wide open. And that's the risk you run when you play this kind of variation. On the other hand, my king is relatively safe. I have not weakened my king position in any way. Although the idea of breaking with f6 has to be taken very seriously, as it is in many variations of the French defense. So, after knight to f3, knight to c6, my opponent played a3. I did not particularly want to exchange bishops and strengthen his control of the center. So I maintained the tension with bishop to a5. So we get to an interesting position in a little while. I'm not sure if this has been played before. Bishop to e3. And I decided to relieve the tension. C takes d4. Knight takes d4. There are various possibilities here, but I thought this is just a rather clear plan of taking on c4 and following up with knight to b6. Made complete sense. And Mark thought for a long time here, and he decided to give me a pawn weakness in my position, which I think is a reasonable thing to do. He has something tangible after knight takes c6, b takes c6. I have a possible long-term weakness on c6. But his king is stuck in the center. I'm actually, based on the fact that I'm castled, a little bit ahead in development because he spent so much time on pawn moves. So after b takes, bishop takes c4. Here I happily played knight to b6, threatening his bishop and threatening knight to d5, hitting f4, hitting e3, hitting c3 again. And here I really have to give him credit. He made a move here which I think is a very, very deep move after some thought. Queen to d3. This is, I thought, a fantastic resource. Protecting c3 and um, protecting his bishop. Willing to give up his bishop. Because he says, okay, You've got two bishops, but your c8 bishop has yet to prove it's going to be able to get into the game. And I really had a dilemma here as to what to do. Um, I don't want to trade queens. I really don't want to trade queens. We have the same situation again, where the opponent's king is in the center, in the middle game. I have the chance to trade queens. I don't want to trade queens. Instead, I took his bishop... And after queen takes c4, we have a very interesting position. Because my following move, bishop to b6, poses a serious problem. Now, after bishop to b6, he could potentially trade bishops. Bishop takes, queen takes. But there's some problems. Maybe his best chance was actually to trade and play castles long. And b2 is protected, f4 is protected. I can play bishop a6, but still I have a pawn weakness at c6. He can guard with rook d2. The other possibility I could have recaptured with the pawn, however, this leaves c6 hanging. I'm not sure if that's something I want to do or not. Maybe I can sacrifice this pawn to play something like bishop a6 and just leave his king completely marooned in the center. I think I might have very, very good compensation for a pawn here since he's unable to castle either side after bishop a6. So, lots of interesting possibilities. In any case, we reach an interesting situation. At this point, Blostein, after considerable thought, played rook to d1. And really, this is a critical moment of the game. 
Mark was convinced that I would play Queen to H4 check here, and I have to admit, I thought about it for a very long time. And really, it does make a lot of sense. The idea is to provoke white to play g3. And after provoking white to play g3, we play queen to h3, threatening to invade on the white squares with queen to g2. And believe me, there's no problem with queen takes c6. Of course, the bishop's hanging on e3, among other things, but for example, after bishop takes b6, a takes b6, queen takes c6. The simple rook b8 and black is in very, very good shape because of bishop b7 being an enormous threat. And the white king completely unsafe in the center of the board in an open position. So, again, during the game I was very conscious of the fact of what I'm preaching here, that I should not trade queens. But I was unable to find a concrete line that really made me believe in putting my queen astray out on h3. This was in fact the best line probably. After queen h4 check, g3, queen h3, the best chance is probably bishop takes b6, a takes b6, queen f1 for white. Just trying to get my queen out of there. But look at this position after say queen f5, um, I don't think white is really better than queen d3, trying to trade queens all the time and probably agreeing to a draw. He has control of the, of the d file. He has the potential to play knight e4 to d6. Um, so I think I would probably take the draw here. But the position is a clear illustration of the principle that I've been talking about. We do not trade queens when the opponent's king is in the center. This bad king can turn into a good king, and it happened again, just like in my other game. I did it again. It's really unbelievable how I let this happen, but it's a true story. I played queen to c7. This in itself is not such a bad move. Queen to c7, not as aggressive as queen h4 check, but not bad. So queen to c7, rather mundane move. Bishop to c5. Now I have a trick. Bishop to a6. And facing those raking bishops, he decided to take one off. So queen takes a6, bishop takes c5. Now, still he cannot castle on either side. So, much like our friend in the first example, he placed his king on e2. The problem here is that it's not so easy to get at him on the white squares as it was in the other game. Mainly because of that pawn on e5 really being a wedge in the position and claiming a lot of space for white, cramping me. You know, I would love to break with f6, but I was concerned about moves like queen to c4. And f6 weakens my own position a little bit, so I was really unsure about it, and it's a very committal thing to do. So I played without f6. After queen to c4, Excuse me. Instead of f6, I played rook on f to d8. A logical move fighting for the center. I think f6 was a riskier way to play. Rook on f to d8. And after this move, I would evaluate the position as about equal. Maybe slightly better for black, though, in the long run, because as long as the queens are on the board, really only black has winning chances because the white king is just not safe with that queen always on the board somewhere. So, queen to c4, bishop to e7, and um, although the position is about level, I still just would rather be black. Here he played a good move, b4, fixing my weakness on c6. So now, as Grandmaster Blostein pointed out, my best move was probably a5. This move, just a simple plan of trading off the pawns on the queen side. Also, the basic idea is to open the position in general. So why wouldn't I make this move? A simple move, opening the position in general when the opponent's king is on e2. I think, in fact, his b4 was a rather risky move because it allows a5. 
So tragically, I missed a5 at the right moment. Um, of course, I was a little bit concerned about b5 for white. b5 for white, but just not clear that it really does even does anything. For example, see, I just played rook on d to c8, if nothing else. I mean, there's no way that black has any problems in this position. Only, only black can possibly be better here because the white king is open. He has a weakness at g2, a weakness at a3. Um, just a terrible failure to listen to my, my own preachings. Um, so instead of playing a5 at the right moment, I played a very silly move that actually had nothing to do with the position, to be honest. Um, just basically a waste of time. I played here queen to, after b4, queen to b6. I mean, I just wanted to get out of any potential pin. I was pinned on the c-file. The threat of b5 made me a little bit nervous, so I played queen to b6, preparing to play a5 probably next move, but my opponent plays knight to a4. Now here, we have a very interesting lesson. I was impatient. And again, I didn't listen to the general principles that I know very well. The best thing to do here is probably to simply play queen to b7. Keeping the queens on the board, keeping the threat of a5 alive. And if he plays knight c5, I can simply move my queen back to b6, if nothing else. And really, honestly, black has no problems whatsoever barring some kind of peace sacrifice on e6, like knight takes e6. But I don't see how it possibly works. After take, 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 king f8, I think that black is okay. So, just, just being calm. We were a little bit short of time, and perhaps this is an excuse, but I panicked here and made a very poor decision. I traded queens with queen to b5. And I justified it by saying, well, it corrects my pawn structure. But um, it's no excuse in this position. I have an advantage. I'm giving him a good king now. I'm turning his bad king into a good king. So not only did I violate the idea of trading queens when the opponent's king is open, I did it in a way, again, that leaves him in a good endgame situation, just for the sake of trading queens to correct my pawn structure. I honestly thought the position was completely equal. But it turns out that white has a nagging advantage in this position. After knight to c3, he has better king. He has an attack on my b5 pawn. The e5 pawn turns out not to be an overextension, but an advantage that cramps me and doesn't give me any room to maneuver. Now, the best move for me is a6. And after something like knight to e4, at that moment, a5 probably starts to work. Unfortunately and tragically, I tried to force things too quickly and miss something. I played a5, and I thought I could just force the liquidation of everything, but it was a terrible mistake. After a5, white has a big advantage. Rook takes d8. Now it's not even clear which recapture is better. After rook takes d8, white's advantage is clear after both recaptures, clear advantage to white in this endgame. So I went from probably slightly better to completely equal to only a tiny bit worse to losing in a period of about five moves after a5. It's pretty much finished. I'm really in bad shape here. The comical end of the game after a5 was rook takes d8, rook takes d8, this may be drawable, but it's extremely difficult at this point. And now b4, and I have to say I kind of missed this move, knight to b5. Now here I should have played b takes a3 with some real drawing chances. But instead, after knight to b5, I made another mistake that compounded my problems. Rook to a8, a takes b4, bishop takes b4, 
I win the pawn on a5, but I have a back rank problem. So after bishop takes b4, rook to b1, and bishop takes a5, rook a1. Sadly, there's no way out of the pin. After rook a1, h5, rook a4, I resigned. My opponent's intention, after something like king to h7, is simply knight a3, king g6, and knight to c4, winning a piece. So, tragic end to a game that I never should have lost. This game should have been minimally a draw for black. If I simply keep the queens on the board when my opponent's king is exposed in the center. In the first game, it should have been a win if I keep the queens on the board while my opponent's king is exposed in the center. So if you sum up these two games, I have only half a point to show out of two games where I certainly should have scored at least one and a half out of two because I failed to listen to the fundamental rule that you do not trade queens when the opponent's king is exposed. This is International Master William Pascal signing off from this lecture series on chesslecture.com.